Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and I am joined by my buddy Ian Boothby, and we're going to find out all about Ian in a little bit. But uh, first, we've got to get into our rundown segment and uh, give you all of the daily news for today. But first of all, it's International Women's Day, and I wanted to take a second to just thank the incredible women that have helped me uh, be the person that I am in my world and in my life. And that starts with my wife, Marcy. Uh, who I adore and love, and we are celebrating 27 years together this year, which is pretty amazing for everybody. <laughs> uh, but also uh, to my mom, Joanne, who passed away a couple of years ago, and to my mother-in-law, Noreen, uh, who passed away as well. And uh, they were just so formative and supportive and beautiful and wonderful. And uh, to, uh, to them and to all the women that support Electric Playground and have watched our content over the years, thank you very much. And I hope you have a marvelous International Women's Day. But let's get started with today's rundown. After months and months of rumors, Activision has officially announced Call of Duty Black Ops 4, the next game in their hit shooter franchise. It's once again being developed by Treyarch, the studio behind the previous Black Ops games. Although that's pretty much all they've said for now. Uh, more intel will be unveiled during a special reveal event in May, and the game itself will deploy October 12th, a month ahead of the franchise's normal release month of November. All right. Now, not to be outdone, Ubisoft and developer Massive Entertainment have officially announced The Division 2, a sequel to their 2016 online action game. Details about the game first leaked early this morning, uh, pro prompting Ubisoft to go ahead and officially announce it after, with a short teaser video on Twitter. They say that they always intended the original game to be the first chapter in an ongoing story, and the sequel will take into account all the feedback that they've received from players over the last two years. We also know that the sequel will run on an updated version of the Snowdrop engine, which means you can expect better graphics and bigger worlds to explore. More details on The Division 2 will be unveiled at E3 this June. That's a pretty good day. Two big, huge shooters are announced today. That's huge. Uh, one of the people who helped get the Marvel Cinematic Universe off the ground is speeding to the galaxy far, far away. Disney has announced that Iron Man 1 and 2 director Jon Favreau will oversee the upcoming live-action Star Wars TV show, serving as executive producer and writer. They still haven't said what the show will be about or when or uh, where it will take place in the vast Star Wars universe, but we do know that Favreau has the creative chops to, chops to bring it to life. The new series will be the first live-action Star Wars show, and it's being produced exclusively for Disney's new subscription streaming platform. The streaming service goes online next year, but the show doesn't have a premiere window yet. I can't wait for this. Mm-hmm. DC Comics is doing something very cool with some of their best characters. DC has announced that they're expanding with a new publishing imprint called DC Black Label, uh, which sounds like a scotch. Uh, the aim is to pair the best writers and artists in the industry and then pair them with the uh, best DC heroes in order to tell unique standalone stories that exist outside of the current DC continuity. The launch books are being crafted by top names like Frank Miller, John Romita Jr., Scott Snyder, and Greg Capullo. And the first three heroes being used are the DC Trinity, I'll, I'll let you guess, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. The first DC Black Label books hit shelves this August. Now, the, we talked about the Nintendo Switch uh, ad nauseum yesterday, so here's a little bit more news for you. <laughs> the Nintendo Switch is a huge hit all over the world, but especially in its home country of Japan. Nintendo has announced that the Switch has now sold 3.8 million units in Japan, which for a little context is more than three times the number of PS4 sold in the country in that system's first year. This means the Switch is on track to beat the PS4 considerably, which is no mean feat given that the PS4 is the most successful console of the current generation. Worldwide, the Switch has sold more than 15 million units. Now, Ian, I understand yeah. that you are a fan of the Nintendo Switch as well. Uh, yeah, I've been playing the uh, the Mario game to death. and uh, it, 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 Okay, listen, I was trying to get him into his underpants for the longest time, and yes. I'm not proud of that. <laughs> But I got him into it, and, uh, and, and I'm happy. I'm surprised. I'm That's too happy been, about that. You've been playing the Mario game for the longest time. I know, time. and I love all the aspects, but I love dressing the guy up. It's pretty fun. I know. It? You learn things about yourself with that game, things you might not want to know. It, it's, it's nuts how 
because that's always the thing that we always make fun of, the character creation and the mm -hmm. dress-up parts of video games, but Nintendo makes the yeah. most fun dress-up part of a video, and with both Mario and Zelda. Yeah, and Zelda, my uh, sister-in-law, is spending most of her time now looking up recipes yeah. uh, to, to make virtual recipes in the game. <laughs> There's a whole, like, sh side show right there. Yeah. You could just make a Zelda cooking show. Mm -hmm. be crazy. Get John Why? Favreau on that. Yeah, He's got the chef background. That's Get right. that in there. Yeah, work. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah. work, work with Nintendo and Disney. That's money in the bank. I like that. Now, are you a uh, Call of Duty fan, or have you uh, zoned out on that? I think I... Well, you know what? I'd say both. I'd say I'm a Call of Duty fan, but a lot of the last couple of games, you can zone out, and I feel like I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in space. I'm on the ground. There's a quick time scene. Who's that guy? I'm Nixon? What's going on? <laughs> it's true. I right? was Nixon, right? I didn't dream that. No, I'm think, Nixon fighting zombies and, at one point. And that is the Black Ops way, right? Anything yes. goes in this twisted uh, story. I think that's one of the reasons why people love it so much. Mm -hmm. And it gives them carte blanche with their multiplayer to throw in whatever they want. Yeah. I, I'm not sure to, if zombies started in Black Ops, but I think it probably did. And, of course, zombies became massive. Right. You know. Uh, but uh, Black Ops 4 is something that I think people have been predicting for a long time. Uh, I dig this series. Mm -hmm. It got a little too twisted and weird with Black Ops 3. Did you play Black Ops 3? Uh, I'm trying. Again, <laughs> it, it becomes this giant. It, again, it's it's like Assassin's Creed. You know, when yeah. you go, did you play this version? Maybe. Yeah. What <laughs> am I jumping off of? And what am I jumping into? <laughs> hey? Well, I don't know. It's always hey. Uh, I think I did. I think yes. I did. Did, what, did you go into space at any point? I that? think, yeah, there was space and robots and... Yes, uh, then I did play that one. But you were shifting your reality because you were changing your consciousness to different <laughs> people and then you didn't know what was real and what wasn't real. Yes, that's, let's go with that. I did play that. That's every Black Ops story pretty yeah, much. Yeah, I think yeah. at this point, yeah, ground it a little more, get the focus a little tighter, yeah. but I will still be on board, yeah. Because they're moving into October, though, I think that means that they have room to now have a November Call of Duty as well and then a December one as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, one every month. I sure. wish the Canadian version would have Canadian prime ministers that you could uh, fight with instead of the American president. <laughs> okay. Johnny McDonald, little Pierre Trudeau, maybe him teaming up with his son. That'd be fun. I, but Activision works in billions. No, so that's I, don't, true. I don't know if billions of people would, would play the Canadian version. Of I don't know. Our, our prime minister right now is very handsome. He is very handsome. <laughs> yes, if you put Trudeau on the box. Yes. Uh, now, Ubisoft uh, revealed The Division 2. Did you play any of The Division 1? I have not. No, sorry about that. That was a cool game. And uh, it was not what was, uh, I think, promised, which you can say about almost every game, yeah, I think, these days. Uh, but, and so a lot of people got pissed off about, at, with the title and lots of updates and changes had to happen over time with The Division. But I think eventually um, people found their way to really enjoy and appreciate this game. It mm -hmm. was very ambitious. It's uh, it's more RPG than a shooter. It does look very fun. Yeah, I'd like to give it a try. Yeah, it's a super cool game with lots of detail. But they got, you know, the um, uh, the developers at Mass have gotten in trouble and Ubisoft uh, for a an early E3 reveal that was so detailed and articulated and beautiful Full, and then, of course, the finished game couldn't quite look like that. So there was this... Uh, and as you said, that never happens. That, that never <laughs> happens. But Ubisoft seemed mm -hmm. to be kind of uh, winning with that uh, sure. franchise. Yes. <laughs> or with that idea over and over again. Uh, but presumably now, with all that they have learned, and Massive is a, you know, a veteran developer with lots of really good development behind them, uh, Division 2 should be something else. I can't okay, wait to cool. see this. Yeah, all right, was, I'm on board. It was cool. It, it got very addictive. A lot of people kept playing it for thousands. Mm -hmm. It's one of those, you know, Destiny-like experiences yeah. where people would meet and just keep playing these matches over and over again. I'm excited to see what they're going to do with that. And I could have predicted that that was coming for E3 as well. It was about time for uh, a big reveal in that franchise. What do you think about Favreau? <laughs> Uh, taking over a Star Wars television show. Uh, I, I I like it. He's got a lot of passion. He's made things work that shouldn't work. A Jungle Book movie should not work <laughs> by any means, right? Yes. Yeah, Bill Murray is Blue should not work, but yeah. he he pulls it off. He's he doing it. the Lion King right now, too, isn't That's he? right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's crazy. What a talented dude. And I... Th I met him when he was building Iron Man, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I think that there was, and we did the behind the scenes with Sega and the Iron Man video game, and we actually got to go to the studios where they were actually cutting the movie and oh, putting wow, effects okay. in. It was a surreal experience, but everything was so low key and so like, we don't know, you know, like we we think, but they they didn't know, you know, and yeah. but there was something in the way that Favreau kind of processed it all and, and talked about all of this stuff, you could see that there was this trajectory that was starting to happen with this guy. He wasn't just a, uh, you know, funny actor that, you know, had some writing skills and some develop, uh, directing skills, 
this, I mean, he's he's a juggernaut guy. Though, doesn't that seem to be the thing now? Is you pick the funny uh, directors, and you get something like a Thor Ragnarok yeah. now. So you know, yeah. there was a while it seemed like that was a bad idea. Um, he used to have a show called Party of Five. Did yeah. you ever see that? Oh no, Table for, or oh, Dinner sorry. for Five. Dinner for Five. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah. Uh, where he'd just talk about his ideas for films, and he thought like, ah, oh, is this guy all talk or not? And it turns out, no, everything he said. He, he actually has uh, done. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's agreed. amazing. So yeah, it'll be uh, super cool to see. Um, it does feel though, and you tell me if, if uh, you agree with this statement that Star Wars is, um, I, you know, and I don't mean to dismiss Kathleen Kennedy because I think she's an incredible business person mm -hmm. and stuff, but it doesn't feel like they have the same uh, sort of creative direction and control that uh, uh, Kevin Feige has got with the Marvel stuff. And I don't know if it's because the Star Wars universe is unexplored. There isn't all this fiction that's pre-built already. Right. Like they're still kind of creating that. Uh, but it does feel like these creators are sort of given some some reign to embellish and go in whatever direction that they want to, as opposed to the Marvel sort of universe, which has some predetermined paths, I think. Well, I think with the Marvel Universe, what they've done, which is smart, is they've got different genres in the films. Yeah. Like uh, Ant-Man is a heist film, Black Panther is in no way an Ant-Man, is in no way a Winter Soldier, is in no way Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. They have so many different genres and styles yeah. that uh, they can bring all these different audiences in, and then when you team them all up, it's interesting. Can You're, Star Wars do that? That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, can you do different genre films with Star Wars? Can you do a, a, just a heist movie in the Star Wars universe? Yeah. Can you do a horror movie in the Star Wars universe? Universe. Yeah, and I think that's what will probably save the Star Wars in the long term. If they keep being too reverent uh, with it, then they won't be able to really move ahead. Which was what Ryan Johnson was saying 100% mm -hmm. in the Last Jedi. We've got to scrub it clean here, and we've got to, yeah. try, you know, with the uh, with the analog of the kid actually sweeping yes. the, the old Star Wars myth right out the door, which is too crazy. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see because I don't know. Like I love Rogue One. Every time I see it, I sort of appreciate it more and more. Mm -hmm. Or even if it was a messy, you know, gestation and and <laughs> reshoots and things had to happen to turn it into what it is, I really appreciate what they did with that. Yeah, movie. my only beef with that was the uh, I, I watched the trailer and the trailer is in no way the movie. Yes, that yeah. they like just ridiculously so. Mm -hmm. That I'm like, oh, what was this? And when I saw that and then I saw the movie, I went, oh, I don't know if they really had an idea for this movie. I feel like they were really making it up on the fly. Yes, yeah, so that's my comment, right? Yeah, like Marvel doesn't feel like that. No, Mar Marvel feels like. We got this, you know, mm -hmm. like they got it mapped for, you know, a millennia here, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's Feggy or if it's because the source material is so prevalent, you know. And the other thing I always say about Star Wars, and I know we can, we'll talk about this with everybody in the chat at the end uh, with our Let's Play in chat. Uh, but I always say that the Star Wars brand, this idea of war being perpetual is a kind of a destructive entity into itself with this, this, uh, this media entity, you know, mm -hmm. like... I, I don't know if people want to watch a war that goes on forever. Well, that was one of the things I liked about the uh, last film was it seemed to be saying, we can't just keep blowing stuff up. Yeah. That's not going to solve our problem. Yeah. You know, so I'd like to see where they go with that. Yes. Yeah. It's really... It's all... tough because you have to celebrate the war because it's Star Wars, yeah. but you shouldn't be celebrating war. Yes. Oh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. And that's what I liked about the DJ introduction as well, Benicio mm -hmm. Del Toro, who I thought was... That was really pointed criticism around the folly of this, you know, the economics of this and uh, pertinent and also like poking holes in the in the whole sort of industry of Star Wars that Disney now owns. You right. Know? It's like there is no right and wrong here. This is silly. And um, that was pretty, that was a profound moment in that movie for sure. And I really appreciated it. Uh, agreed. But I don't know, you know, I feel like Ryan Johnson said, okay, now your turn. <laughs> Go ahead, JJ, <laughs> fix that. You know, so I, we'll see what happens here with episode nine. And with uh, a Star Wars TV show, and this, mm -hmm. Disney, this Disney streaming service is turning out to uh, to be more and more exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, DC Comics uh, wanting to kind of, uh, I think, uh, scrub things a little bit cleaner and, and give people some standalone books. That's a good idea, yes? Uh, I agree with that. It seems to be uh, solving a problem that they've gotten themselves into with all the event crossover things. You mm -hmm. know, we, we want to do standalone stories. You can. Yeah. You, they've got comic I mean, Batman has, I don't know, like three comic books. You can do a Batman standalone comic if you're saying, like, the big thing is, like, we got to make a Batman standalone. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, this is this is this is good. I mean, I'm fine when they do like a an Earth One or something, and this seems similar to that, where you get the top talent to do the the high profile books. That's that's great. Yeah. That's fine, and it feels a little bit like they're hunting for movie material with this too. 
You know, I, you want I, a standalone story, then you can take that and probably adapt that into a movie easier than you can, you know, a, a, a real long patch of comics. I think that's the only way to go, right? Like mm -hmm. there are multimedia company now and there's rumors that if the AT&T and Warner Brothers deal doesn't come together that uh, uh, Time Warner may divest itself of DC so they need to figure out a way to kind of maximize their uh, their value I think to more people you yeah. know because I think that that just appealing to that comic you know sort of group the diehards out there that are buying the monthlies and sort of tuning in regularly to pick up the comics and if that's all you focus on you're not really hitting the wider kind of spectrum. Yeah. You know? And it, it feels like Marvel's hurting a little bit on the comic side, I think, in terms of sales. Okay. But they're doing well with all the, you know, the merchandising and the branding and the movies and the TV shows and all that stuff. And it's, I think DC's actually doing pr pretty well with a lot of the comic choices and the risks, like Brian Michael Bendis coming yep. over and stuff like that. Uh, and, and some of the weird brands that they have. There's a quirkiness that's, I think, being celebrated with DC. But they need to kind of up their movie game a little bit. So Yeah, it feels like with Marvel, the best version of the characters that you like, the best Spider-Man you're going to be seeing is probably in the movies. Yeah. Uh, though there's still some good stuff in the in the comics, and in DC it's the opposite. If you want to see a really good Batman story, you better yeah. read the comics, not so much not so much the films. Mm -hmm. Have you been reading, is it Tom King who's got Batman right yeah, now? Pretty, yeah, some pretty wild stuff. Incredible. Yeah. yeah incredible stuff. All right, you guys, we are going to be talking some more. And remember, help us out with the uh, uh, with the chats. If you guys have some comments or questions, Blake's reading through as much as he can. If you put it all into all caps, it's easier for us to see. Uh, but we're going to be talking some more. We're going to find out a little bit about uh, Ian's background and some of the new stuff that he's working on. But first, let's take a look at this day and everything cool.